Hi everyone, welcome to Learn Neuroradiology. Today we're going to take a look at a cervical spine CT search pattern. We'll talk a little bit about how you might approach a cervical CT and what some of the common indications are. When you see a cervical spine CT, most frequently the indication is going to be trauma. If you work at a trauma center, you'll see a lot from motor vehicle accidents and other traumas, falls, etc. Neck pain is an indication for doing a CT. Frequently, you'll see them from the emergency department. For chronic pain, you're not going to have as good an evaluation as you would have with an MR, so it might make sense to go ahead and do an MR, but you'll see them anyway. For evaluating hardware, you'll frequently see it because you want to evaluate the structure of the hardware, if there's any loosening of what the situation is with the surrounding bone, so it's kind of a useful tool for evaluating hardware. Now, when you open a CT of the cervical spine, you can take a bit of a strategic approach. You can first look at the scalp. That can give you a little bit of information about the alignment. And then I recommend using your reformats first. Uh, in the modern era, you typically have sagittal and coronal reformats. That tells you a lot about the alignment, and you're going to know a lot about the study before you even move on to your axial images. Then you'll have axial bone and soft tissue images that you can take a look at. Frequently, then, you can use your thin bone images at the very end uh, as a troubleshooting measure. So here I've pulled up a scout image from a CT of the cervical spine. It gives you a little bit of a notion of the overall alignment. So you can see the anterior uh, line here, the ALL, and you want to see it like more or less lined up. You have the PLL here, and uh, you want to see that again more or less lined up, and uh, the ligament of labrum along the posterior margin of the spinal canal. You want to have that all lined up. You don't want to have too much space uh, inferior to the occipital condyles here, and you don't want to have too much space between the posterior arch of C1 and C2. So this gives you a nice overview before you even get started. Here I've pulled up the reconstruction images from that cervical spine. On the left, you're going to have the sagittal images. I'll start to scroll through, and I'll kind of scroll through until I get to the middle image here. And as you come through, what you're going to see is you'll see the alignment of all the facets. And this is on the right side, so all of those facets should be lined up. None of them should be too wide. And you want to come to that midline image, and that midline image is going to give you the vast majority of information. And much like the scallop, you want to see a normal alignment of the ALL here, so you want to see that anterior line lining up. Uh, you want to see the posterior longitudinal ligament line up. So you want to see smooth contours and not too much uh, displacement there uh, because you don't want to have any injury through the disc or any uh, traumatic subluxation. Here you see there's a little bit of anterolisthesis or C2 is a little bit forward on C3, but that's not really that much and it's probably from degenerative disease. Back in the old days, we used to say that if there was a reversal of lordosis, so a cervical spine usually has a curvature like a reverse C, if it was straight or reversed, then you might think about ligamentous injury. Now, the vastly most common thing for that is just going to be the positioning of the patient in the scanner, because many times they're going to be in a cervical collar. Here, you see that the ligament of flavum is lined up normally, and then you see the space between these posterior elements is normal. Now, I'm going to go back to the right a little bit, and we're going to again look at those facets. So all of your facets should be lined up. None of them should be displaced with respect to the other. You want to also take a look at your occipital condyle here. It should fit normally and C1 because there's an articulation there. Then uh, you want to go to the other side and you want to see that that alignment is the same. So again, your occipital condyle is nicely seated there and then all of your facets line up nicely. You'll note that in this person, there's a little bit of widening of these facets here, a little bit of degeneration. There's also a little bit of degeneration along the anterior arch of C1 here. Now, as you move on, you want to take a look at your coronal images. And similarly, uh, what you're going to do is check for the overall alignment. So as you come into the spine, you're going to see the alignment of all these vertebral bodies. You note those degenerative changes along the anterior margin of the dens there. But you're going to get a nice look at the overall alignment particularly here at the craniocervical junction. You see here is the occipital condyle sitting nicely on C1. C1 is here. 
you can have a little bit of asymmetry between the dens and C1. Here you see on the left it's a little bit closer, but you don't want to have too much asymmetry there. Here you should see that all the vertebral bodies are lined up. See your disc intervals, nothing's looking suspicious there. You don't see any cortical displacement or cortical breaks. Uh, you want to check your ribs as you go through, and you want to see all your alignment. Here you get another view of the facets. Again, they're lined up uh, pretty symmetrically bilaterally. You don't see any facets that are severely displaced. So we can scroll through, look at your spinous processes, get a little bit of the skull base here, and catch all the spinous processes here. Here you see the transverse processes of T1. You see the first rib here, so you can check those out as you go back. And so after looking at the bones in this, we've seen our sagittal and coronal images. We can feel pretty comfortable that this is a relatively normal patient. We don't have any big displaced fractures. And we sort of have that in mind before we move on to our axial images. Now we're going to move on to taking a look at some of the axial images. Now on the left here, I've left up your sagittal reformat. That way you can use the localizer line, kind of have an idea where you're going. I definitely recommend using that uh, to kind of keep you oriented. Here in the middle, I have a soft tissue reconstruction, so it's a reformat. Uh, to get a better look at the soft tissue, so it's smoothed out a little bit so we can see the spinal canal. And then on the right, we have a bone window uh, that's also reformatted with the bone construction kernel, so it's a little bit sharper. Will be nicer for seeing uh, the soft and the bones themselves, looking for any cortical breaks or disruptions of the cortex. Now, you want to start off, uh, we'll start off looking at the, uh, we'll look at the bone over here on this side. And, but I've linked these axials so you'll go through them together. Uh, just because it's a cervical spine, you don't want to forget to look at the skull base. Take a look at the temporal bones here. Make sure there's no mastoid fusions or asymmetries there. You're going to come through the clivus here down into the occipital condyles. Now these are the slightly thicker slices. Uh, so it's just giving you kind of an overview so far. Come down into the occipital condyles. When you get to here, you're seeing the upper part of the dens, the anterior arch of C1. So you expect to see C1 as a complete arch, so you want it to make a complete ring. It's relatively common to have congenital variants where those are unfused, but when you do, you should see nice, smooth cortication around each interface. You shouldn't see any cortical breaks there. Uh, here, for instance, you see a little bit of degenerative change, but nothing that's a fraction. And then your localizer line is showing you on central images where we're located right here at C1, C2. Then you want to take a look down. As you go through, you want to just scroll through these uh, in each vertebral body. You want to take a look at the cortex, the posterior elements, and make sure that you don't have any cortical breaks or cortical disruptions. You want to just come through that for, uh, for your entire study until you're satisfied that there's no fracture there. Now, for instance, you see a slice like this where you're going through the facet. In the old days, it would be very challenging to tell whether this was a jumped facet or disrupted there. But for us, it's very simple because we go through and we check on the reformatted images. We can see the facets line up nicely and that you just happen to catch it between the slice. So you want to keep going down and you're going to see your upper thoracic vertebral bodies. You're going to see the first rib and the first couple of ribs here. You're going to see your lung apices as well. Then uh, I recommend going back to the start of your study, maybe start from the top, and then take a look at the soft tissues. So again, look at the uh, inferior portions of the posterior fossa. Now you see a little bit of a big sulcus there, but probably no big deal. And you want to make a pass through the study looking at the spinal cord which you see here and the spinal canal. It's very common to see some prominent epidural veins here at C1, C2. Not all of these are going to be epidural hematomas but at each level you should see the spinal cord. You should see it surrounded by CSF and be able to make it out. If you don't check and you don't make a pass to look at the spinal cord you're going to miss epidural hematomas. You're going to be Big, miss big degenerative discs that are going to cause problems.
Uh, again, everything here has looked okay. Uh, I recommend you take one good look at the lungs. So uh, take a look here. Sorry, I'm just going to change windows here. Uh, I'm switching to a lung window. Next to the bone here. So you want to take a look at the lung avices. You want to make sure there are no pulmonary nodules, no big pneumothorax. If you have a trauma patient, that definitely can happen. And then you also want to come back up, take a look at the soft tissues themselves. You see this dense structure here on this non-contrast study is the thyroid. Uh, you want to take a look for any abnormal lymph nodes in the neck. You want to look for any hematoma you may have in the soft tissues, any swelling in the posterior paraspinous musculature that would lead you to believe that there's an injury. Uh, you want to be sure that you check out the hyoid bone and thyroid cartilage. You can have fractures of those, particularly if you have a direct blow. Once you are uh, finished, you want to maybe come up a little higher, take a look at the pharyngeal soft tissues, make sure you're not missing a mass or anything there. Frequently, you will have another reformat of your sagittals in a soft tissue window. So you see, again, this is much more averaged to take a look at soft tissues. Uh, so you have very smooth. You see uh, this chain of internal jugular nodes here. Uh, it also gives you a better look at the spinal canal. So you can see the uh, epidural soft tissues here, kind of at the skull base and C1, C2. You get a nice look at the spinal cord as it goes down so you don't have any epidural hematomas there. And uh, just check those soft tissues. So that's kind of the last thing you're going to, to look at. One final step that I recommend that you take whenever you're looking at a cervical spine, particularly if it's for trauma, is that you take a look at your thin slices or your thin axials in a bone reconstruction. What I've done here is replace this middle with a thin bone reconstruction. So these are 0.6 millimeter slices, whereas these on the right are 2.5 millimeter slices. And I'll just scroll through a little bit so you can tell the difference. Uh, you'll see the bone interfaces are a little bit sharper. Uh, you'll see that several slices are passing through this middle window in the same period of time that a single slice is passing on the right. Now this can be a nice way to troubleshoot any problems that you've had. If you had some areas where you were wondering if there was a vascular channel or another subtle abnormality, you can take a look, get a better look at that. Uh, but again, you see how sharp the cortical interfaces are compared to the thicker slices where they're more averaged off. Fractures of the cervical spine, especially after trauma, can be quite subtle. So this is a nice way to make sure you're not missing any subtle linear fractures. And that's usually my last step of the study as I've gone through the cervical spine. Here we've seen a spine that's pretty normal, a little bit of degenerative change uh, at C1, C2, and a little bit of facet degeneration here on either side but uh, not much in the way of uh, traumatic injury, so no real concerns that there's a traumatic injury here. As we conclude, I'll just point out these final tips. For a cervical spine CT, you definitely want to use your reformats to your advantage. I highly recommend making separate passes in your soft tissue windows to take a look at the spinal canal, as well as extra spinal soft tissues. You're not really thinking about them as much, but you definitely want to make sure you're seeing any abnormalities there and then use your thin axial slices for troubleshooting. Thanks for your attention today. Uh, we've covered the CT of the cervical spine. Please uh, like our channel and subscribe to our future updates if you want to see more videos of this type. And thank you for your attention.